at six years old, from that point on for, till I was 40, I had a tendency to want to prove to my dad that I was good enough. But that didn't just stick with my dad, that stuck with anyone in a position of authority. So interesting that I became a professional athlete and had coaches who were sort of like a father figure, who I had to prove that I was good enough to all the time. The fitness world is changing. Fitness celebrities, expert trainers, bodybuilders, and athletes are learning how to redefine fit. On the Rethink Fit and Grow podcast, you're going to hear real-life stories from the heart, tales of transformation, and learn how you can be part of this worldwide movement. And now, it's time to Rethink Fit and Grow with your host, Della Fatui. Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Rethink Fit and Grow podcast. Today's guest is the awesome Tony Priddle. Tony is the founder of We Transcend and a former professional rugby league player whose experience as an elite athlete has positioned him as an expert in the field of optimum performance. Tony was a pro athlete playing what is regarded as one of the toughest body contact sports in the world. Tony has a degree in sports science from the University of NSW, is a master NLP practitioner, advanced hypnotherapist, memory remapping expert, and is currently undertaking studies in the science of breath work and cold water immersion therapy. Tony's life purpose is to show people they are so much more than they think they are right now. He focuses on uncovering and developing the education and coaching required for people to achieve their best in whatever it is that they are choosing to do. Ladies and gentlemen, it is absolutely my honor to bring you on the Rethink Fit and Grow podcast, Tony Priddle. Hello, Tony. Hi, Della. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I'm so excited to talk to you today. Thank you for being here. That is my pleasure, and I can't wait to speak to you. It's, um, I get to talk about something that I just truly love. What is it you love, Tony? In essence, it's uncovering the potential someone has that's basically hidden from them. I get, I get to see every day how we can make small and big changes so someone actually can reach their full potential. And I've worked with clients ranging from multi-millionaires to actor, actors, actresses, and athletes. But this, this type of work that I'm doing doesn't stop with um, that type of um, high-end performance stuff. It can go into the uh, mental health world because it's just about understanding what, who we are, what we are, and how our brain actually works. Once we can understand these kind of things, we can actually be better in, an, in anything we do. That is truly how we can reach our full optimum potential, isn't it? Yeah, well, uh, in, the, in the athletic world, and why I do what I do is because in my early days, all I did was do all the physical work. I've got a sports science degree, so I went in and studied my body. I was in a time where sport in uh, the NRL in Australia was becoming full-time professional so I was a, I had been a full-time professional athlete and we had the best coaches the best physios the best doctors the best essentially the best part of the physical aspect of sport we were we had that at our fingertips you know the best gyms and the best training methods at, of the day and I left and when I retired I didn't I didn't feel I fulfilled my full potential and I always felt that there was something missing or something getting in my road of doing that. So when I, and it, well, as essentially this just created a life of a little bit of discontent because always looking over your shoulder going, well, I could have done that better. Yes. And I've always been a little bit different 
How I took, so? Um, How so? I've, I've been a little bit odd. I've been very, very focused on certain aspects of my life and information and learning. So I, I would get obsessed with something. So with sport, I, I started um, – my goal in sport was to represent my country and it didn't matter in what sport. I just wanted to represent my country, either go to, you know, Commonwealth Games, Olympics or play for Australia in a team sport. And as I was growing up, I – was very focused on two sports and one was flat water rowing and the other one was rugby league. Basically that became my whole life. So training, you know, five, seven days a week on the water, rowing in the summertime and then, you know, training for football in the wintertime. And I've always thought a little bit differently in my approach to things. So I was very strict and I followed the rules and I did what I was told to do. Basically, very mentally inflexible. And that caused a lot of, when I, in my playing days as a professional athlete and being a young man, that caused me a lot of uh, emotional stress while I was there. I thought I was very professional and thought I was doing a great job by training hard and being, you know, doing all the physical stuff, but I didn't really cope mentally. Mm. And I mean, I can imagine that and I think a lot of people can relate to that because you did everything that you could have possibly done physically to to get to that level and uh, you thought that it was going to happen if I only kept the discipline, if I only worked really, really, really hard and practiced, I would get there. Absolutely. And, that, and that's basically the philosophy that still works you know, in sport and, and so forth today. So, yes, I literally thought if I did everything physically and trained very, very hard, I would make my goals. I always kept up coming short. I always ended up coming, you know, short of my goals. You know, I'd make, I'd make certain teams and then I, would, then I would be, you know, overlooked or something like this or then I would have an injury that would come up. And so when you didn't make it there what happened professional sports brutal when you're not when you're not required anymore you're cut so if you're not performing or you're injured you are cut and you're let go and that's okay because that's the sport as a young man it took me four years to adjust to the real world outside of the sport oh my gosh it would because you've invested imagine you've invested all of your life so far into making this thing happen and then it can be taken away from you just like that and then what are you going through well it, yeah the dream the dream started at you know say 14 years old and i virtually i virtually trained every day since i was 14 like and i'm talking even till now i've trained virtually every day and yes i did a, i did an acl which is an anterior cruciate ligament and I did a year's worth of rehab. Then I got back to playing, and three games later, I did the I did the same ACL again. So that essentially ended my professional career because um, I had a bad operation. The operation did the graft didn't take. It didn't get a blood supply. So essentially, I had a dead graft in my knee, and it just snapped again. And I had to go back and get another operation so that was essentially the end of my professional career i did play four or five years after that at a semi-professional level it was the end of it was the end of the big time mm. because no one wanted no one wanted to pick up an athlete that you know has the potential to um you know break down easier than previously so i got to play three or four years on in a semi-professional level so that was that was good but when i finished sport i was completely cut off away from the sport that made it very difficult to transition into everyday life. You were going from a, from a professional sports salary to a normal wage. Of course. So, and this, and, you know, eventually, it, you know, it, I worked out it wasn't the, it wasn't the sport. It wasn't the, you know, the general, general work population or doing the normal things. It was how I thought about the world. This is why I do what I do because it was all mental. And you know this now, Tony, 
Like, you know this now, but what was going on through your young mind back then? What kind of a future did you did you have in, <laughs> you know, but really, because I'm, wow. I'm good. I, I'm really serious about this because there are so many young people who have this dream and this ideal of making it. And then most of them don't make it. And so, you know, you know, the mental health. That is going along with that. Well, why I laugh then is because if you can imagine the life of a professional athlete, like, I mean, it's tough, right? Like it's physically tough and it's demanding. I actually love the training. The training was the best part of it. So the physically demanding part was the bit I loved the most. It was um, the playing was probably one step down from the training, but the rest of it was very difficult for me to handle so the media the fans the the sponsors the you know going out and doing appearances and um you know you're a kid from a town of three thousand people and people are walking up and asking for your autograph and stuff like that you're looking at them and going why the hell do you want my autograph even though you're playing the sport i look back and i go well i've had a gr- I like i mean my first 10 years of my working life were playing professional sport or semi-professional sport where I did nothing else. I didn't actually have a real job. And I finished that and I realized that I had to go to work for eight hours a day, even though this is back in the, this is back when I didn't realize what kind of potential I had, but I had to go to work for eight hours a day. I was, I was making, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars being an athlete. And my first job out of sport was $32,000. Wow. So my thinking back then was I've just done something that most people don't do. And it was so much fun, even though I struggled to enjoy a lot of it, so much fun compared to getting up every day, going to a job that I have to be there for eight hours a day, I have to wear this particular uniform and I have to do what I'm told and I get an hour for lunch and then I can go home and then enjoy myself. Like I actually sat there and thought, I've just done the best thing I'm ever going to do in my life. So the rest of my life is going to be a little bit boring or a lot boring. Mm-hmm. So so that was that was my general line of thought when I finished the sport. And that took a, you know, like that's what I said, I took four years to adjust to life outside of sport. Yeah. That, like I retired at 30 at 29, I didn't understand. I'd been looking for certain aspects, you know, uh, certain things that would uh, make me happy. So I was actually looking outside because I, I actually thought the sport made me happy. I thought the fame made me happy. The money made me happy. So after having that type of lifestyle, I was look, kept looking outside of me, well, what's going to make me happy? And it wasn't until I was 40, so 10 years down the track after retirement, I started to understand that this whole thing's an inside job. There's only one way for me to be happy, and that is to actually like myself, or probably more importantly, to love myself just the way I am. What a realization. Yeah, well, this, yeah, well, this is what I didn't understand, right? Because the sport wasn't going to make me happy because I was always trying to be better. The money wasn't going to make me happy because – I could spend that really easily and it could be gone. And like, I mean, it was gone. Once I got, I left the sport, I was making hundreds of thousands of dollars down to a normal wage. I'd, I'd always been into performance because of the physical performance with, with the degree. And I, you know, did little bits and pieces of learning and, you know, self-help style of stuff and working with psychologists. But no one ever taught me how my mind worked, how it actually works. Not how we think it works, how it works, how it's programmed, actually how we become who we, who we think we are, how we behave. Like this is really important stuff and this is what I realised. But it comes down to one very, very simple thing and that's how much you like yourself. Our whole system is designed to perceive that everything outside us is cause, causes all our problems, that either makes us happy or, or makes us upset. So we actually have to understand how it, you know, how it all works so we can start to turn it around. And even knowing who and what we are was probably one of the biggest shifts I ever had. So once I understood this, I, was, I had the ability to then control my mind, therefore I could control my life. And essentially that's what I do what I do because I want to be able to give young people the ability or the wisdom, wisdom is embodied knowledge, 
to be able to enjoy the best genetic years of their life with the most enjoyment and fun that they can have. Wow, that sounds amazing. So we'll be right back to hear the rest of this, but we're just going to take a short break. Don't go anywhere. What if you had the ability to write your future through healing your past? Optimum human performance. To be the best version of you. Live a life of joy and happiness. Create whatever you want. At We Transcend, we use the most up to date science combined with the most innovative technology and unique coaching methods to assist the human being as a whole. Combining mind, body, and spirit to reach ultimate mental and physical performance. We Transcend, evolving human potential. Book a call today at www.wetranscend.net. And we're back with Tony. We are teaching our kids so much, but some of the most important stuff, the stuff that is going to get them through life, we don't teach them. I actually start all my coaching when I, have, when I work with a client with one particular question. Ooh, I'm interested. And, well, and that is, okay, tell me who you are. Wow. If you asked me that question, I don't know how I would answer that question, Tony. Most people actually don't because it's not a question that's asked, right? Because we will say, well, my name is this and this is what I do and, you know, a, a whole bunch of other stuff that's in our bio. But really, how do you answer that question? If I asked you, Tony, how would you answer that question? Well, I would actually go, okay, let's, can, you, can you just open a dictionary and look up what human being means? Like this is the simplest way for me to answer that question. I don't know who I am. I'm... I can embody, I've embodied who I am. I can, but it's, it's, we're actually told, this is what blows my mind. We are actually told in our dictionary. Human means homo sapien, which is our species. Being, what does being actually mean? And it means the nature or essence of a person. You ask me who I am? Yes. I'm a spirit, I'm a spiritual being having a journey in this body in this lifetime. That is how I'll answer that question. Guess what I'm not though? Guess the the most important thing is what you're not. If I am a spiritual being having a journey here, what am I not? I'm not my name. You introduced me as Tony, right? Yes. My parents christened me Anthony. I only ever get called Anthony when I'm in trouble with my mother. (laughs) So I don't even know why Anthony, like Anthony's on my license. I don't like the name Anthony. And no one's ever called me Anthony other than it's on my birth certificate. So I've got a name that I don't even use and everyone calls me Tony. When I played sport, everyone, and in Australia it's a very big tradition to give people a nickname. So my nickname here is Prids, P-R-I-D-Z, so shortening of my last name Priddle to Prids. Guess what? I answered all three of those names. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in a relationship I get called Honey, Sweetie, you know, or other not so good names, um, <laughs> and you answer to the, <laughs> you answer to those as well, right? Yes. So I'm not my name. I was a like I used to talk about this. Like people go, well, and people go, oh, Tony, tell me who you are, and I'd go, well, I'm an ex athlete that I'm an ex professional athlete. So I would even answer to something that I don't even do now. So I'm not an athlete. Athlete, being an athlete was something that I did. Having a job, something that I have. Having a, like, and people go, well, I'm happy go lucky. I'm, I'm um, you know, friendly and blah, blah, blah. And I look at them and go, well, have you ever been, have you ever disliked someone and not been friendly? Well, you're not friendly. That's not who you are. That's just how you act. So it's more important to understand how, who you're not because you're not a behavior, you're not a job, you're not um, your name. You're not where you grew up. You're not your country. You are conditioned by your parents, by your country, by your religion, by your the schooling system. Wherever you grow up, that actually becomes part of the program. And, you know, I'm sitting here talking about a program. Your brain runs on prediction algorithms. Like, and this is what most, but this is what I mean by understanding, understanding how your brain actually works. Because your brain doesn't react to anything ever. You never make a conscious decision ever. Your brain runs prediction algorithms. It's always ahead of 
your understanding of it. The brain fires 400 milliseconds later, you are, become aware of what happens, whether it's an action, emotion, uh, reaction, whatever it is. An action, I should say, not reaction, an action. And then 200 milliseconds after that, you actually perform the task. Most people don't even, most people don't have the awareness. They just go into the task. And this life just seems seamless. We're just going along and we, we think we're reacting to the stuff that's out there. We're not reacting. We're predicting it. We would have died a long time ago if we didn't have these prediction mechanisms in place. So these are the things we need to understand to get to your best performance. So Tony, understanding that uh, we make decisions based on previous beliefs, previous experience, yes, experiences, right? Experiences, beliefs, um, situations, learnings, whatever your experience creates, the way you're going to um, act in the moment with the input that's coming in. And this is really simplified, right? Zero to eight years old, 75% of your personality is created. 75% of who you are is created by the time you're eight years old. That's crazy. It's crazy, you're right, but this this is the science that shows this. And it's all to do with brainwaves. So brainwaves are really important. So if I believed when I was five years old, that I wasn't good enough to do something, then if I don't tackle that and change those beliefs, I'm going to forever think that I'm not good enough. We are conditioned to believe we are not good enough because our brain in those early formative years, it doesn't, it can't critically think or, you know, um, go against what's said. It just takes in what's said and you just happen to believe that. If you have this self-doubt in you now at 40 years old, say. 49, thank you. 49? (laughs) Well, if you have this self-doubt at 49. Shh, don't tell anything. (laughs) You understand that it has 75% chance of happening, that belief happening before you're eight years old. So you're essentially acting like an eight-year-old at 49. But understand, our brain's plastic and evolves the whole time. Like we do not, it doesn't stop evolving from 25, which is what it used to, what we used to think. We learn all the time. We've embedded into us a set of ways of predicting certain situations that are going to be detrimental as we move into adulthood. And I think every, and this is what, this is what I discovered about my mind when I, like no one taught me this when I was 17 or 18, going into professional sport. I literally had to make it on my own. I literally had, this is what you're being given. You either make it or you don't. That's our world right now. That's every organization, every opportunity we get thrown at us. It's here's what you've been given. Here's the system. Now, if you don't fit into the system, you're not going to make, you know, school's a system, right? Yes. Uni's a system. Professional sports a system. Business is a system. And they're all pyramid orientated. They all, people rise to the top, right? And there's very, and in our world, it's about 3% of the people make it big. 97% of the population is kept small and downtrodden. 90, you know, like we look at stats on retirements and all this kind of stuff. Most of the population die broke. In Australia, we, we're taught to spend $1.16 $1. for every dollar we make in our lifetime. And in America, it's $1.26 for every dollar you make in your lifetime. So we're conditioned, socially conditioned to spend more money than we make. So we're going to die poor. Like if you don't do something about this, you're going to die poor. If you want to be the best at something, you actually got to change the way you think about it so you can fit into that system. Well, the way I see it is, Tony, what you're explaining to me, it's not only just for the athletic world. It's not just for athletes. It's really for anyone who is trying to make it in anything. Yes. Yes, I can work with anyone. What we need to create is emotional intelligence, resilience, and self-belief. But how do you learn these things? They're actually skills. And what people don't realize is that all these things that we're dealing with, emotional intelligence, right? Yes. It's actually a skill. But who teaches how to be emotionally intelligent? Anxiety is a skill. And yes, there are genetic things that can cause people to worry more or think about future thoughts more. But essentially, it's a skill. What humans do is get better at what they do all the time. 
So if we have negative future thoughts all the time, we get very good at what we call anxiety. Whoa, I've never heard it quite in that way before. Think about who becomes really good at something. Like in the athlete world, who becomes really good? People who have trained a long time with the with deliberate practice and the right coaches, right? Yes. But who coaches how the brain works, how it, you know, how you think, why you think, and what you think. So anxiety is a skill. So is depression. Like I hate to say it, but they're skills. The more you do it, the better you get at it. 100%. It's the neurological firing pattern. You know, have you ever heard what fires together wires together, right? That's Hebb's law. Mm. So you get up every day and you do your same routine and you do not change your environment, you're going to think the same thoughts every day. You're going to have the same habits every day. Physically, we can understand this, but mentally it's, it's a lot different to understand. But it shouldn't be. So that's where the athlete side of things comes in it for me. I'm, um, I played in a position, it's similar to alignment, like it's sort of similar, I think, thought pattern to alignment in the NFL. Um, you know, one of the biggest guys on the field that basically is there to stop people coming forward and, and you know, making as much ground as I can. So we're looked at as not too smart. So big, um, but not too smart. So I have things have to be simple for me, right? Mm-hmm. So if you look at it from a perspe- that perspective, everything's a skill. Emotional intelligence, resilience, self-belief. Do those things get taught at school? No. Self-love. Self-love, yeah. Um, anxiety, depression. We, we probably need to look at it in a different way. And we probably need to stop practicing things, certain things. And there's ways you can actually get up and control your thinking in the morning. You know, and this is, this is the stuff I teach now. If you want to be better at anything, learn to control your mind. You want to have better relationships. You want to have better, you know, better at your job, dealing with your boss, whatever it is. Control your mind because it's controlling you right now if you're not controlling it. Control your mind, control your life. Uh, yes, but there's some, there's some steps and processes that need to be learned. One of the biggest things I teach is called remapping memories. So you know how we're talking about zero to eight years old? Yes. Well, essentially, if we can remap those memories in that zero to eight years old bracket, fastest way to move forward I've ever seen. Change habits, phobias, and fears in an instant. I have to ask you a question. What did you discover about yourself, Tony? What was holding you back? That's pretty complicated and intricate because we get bombarded with 4 billion bits of information per second. We only process 2,000 of those bits. So you're learning a lot when you're a kid. One of the biggest memories that I remapped early on was an incident that happened when I was six years old learning to mow the lawn. And I was learning to mow the lawn. My father was up on the balcony watching me mow this lawn and I hadn't done it before, so, you know. And I mowed down one way, turned the mower around and come back and I mowed off the strip and I left a strip of grass on the ground. And my father came down off the balcony um, kicked me up the backside, this is putting it nicely, kicked me up the backside, said that I was basically hopeless and I couldn't do anything right. At six years old, from that point on for till I was 40, I had a tendency to want to prove to my dad that I was good enough, but that didn't just stick with my dad, that stuck with anyone in a position of authority. So. Interesting that I became a professional athlete and had coaches who were sort of like a father figure who I had to prove that I was good enough to all the time. So that was probably the most interesting one I found in that way. And as soon as I remapped that memory, my whole life changed because I didn't have to please other people anymore, especially father figure type people, you know, bosses, father figures, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, that was probably the biggest thing that held me back. Always trying to have to prove myself to that father type figure and do my best in all, you know, like, like worry about what they thought all the time. When you realized that and you went back and remapped this memory, this um, incident and what it had meant to you all these years, to what meaning did you change it then? Yeah, so when, when you remap a memory, you only, you only remember a memory the way you remember it with the, with the ability you have to remember that memory <laughs> in the moment. So as a six-year-old doesn't have any tools, but as a 40-year-old, I can go back into that memory and see all aspects of that memory. So it's a really good question uh, because at 40 years old, I could actually, I can step back and this goes into where you're focusing your conscious mind. So conscious mind is the only thing you're aware of in the moment. So we've got a very small conscious mind and we can, we can then, we miss most of the stuff that goes on. But when we focus our conscious mind, when we bring into, when we have an intention and focus, we can actually bring anything into our conscious mind. And this is how it all works. But when you're remapping a memory, you can look at it from the perspective of 40 year old. Like I was able to look at it from the perspective from the perspective of the 40-year-old and understand why my father did treated his six-year-old son like that. And I was able to forgive him in the moment and understand why he did it. So I got to see my dad as he um, he was on the balcony of the of our house and he was pretty shitty with his life because he was made by his father. His father was a farmer. He was made by his father to get a job in the public service, as in paid for by the government, because it was safe and steady because farming wasn't safe and steady. So he was doing a job that he essentially did for 40 or 50, 40 odd years that he didn't really like. Then he had a wife and three kids that he was struggling with. So at the, in that time, he used to go to the pub a lot. And why you go to the pub is to get out of your own head so you can stop thinking. So you, you take a a drug of sorts to get out of your head, right? Yes. And I didn't know this at six because I'm a six-year-old. I haven't got brain waves to, to so my brain works like this. But when you actually can step back and look at the whole situation, and we have every bit of that information in our memory, so I got to witness this from my standpoint at 40. So my dad was frustrated with his life. He wasn't frustrated with me. It wasn't my fault. He actually loved us. He did everything for us. But in those moments, in those traumatic moments, we take on these belief systems that aren't even relevant because it's not really what happened. My dad did come down and kick me up the bum and tell me I was hopeless and I couldn't do anything right, but it wasn't because of me. It was because of how he felt. And then I, it was because he was frustrated with his life. He came and took it out on me as a six-year-old. And when I saw that, boom whole belief system evaporated in one moment in time. Wow. He was there to support us. That's all he was there doing. He, and, like, I, I got to ask him afterwards, what do you want for us kids? He just went, I just want you guys to be happy and had a better life than I had. Oh, man. But we don't ask those questions at six. No. But if we can go in and do that type of work, it changes our life. Yes. Because that's what we're holding. We're holding on to stuff like this. So, yeah, vital part of what I do is teach people how to remap memories. Oh. Essentially, this is all about knowing who you are, what you are, how your mind works, and then understanding what are the factors. And it's pretty easy. If you have a negative emotional upset in an inappropriate time and it's not bettering your life, you have a belief system where you can go and remap the memory that created that belief system. It's pretty, it's that simple. That's it. Bada bim, bada boom. But you got to learn how to do those processes. And that's where you come in. Correct. So Tony, if someone wants to start working with you, how could they reach you? So website is wetranscend.net. So wetranscend.net. Or they can find me on 
social media. I like uh, basically Facebook's probably the easiest one for for me. At Tony Priddle, we transcend. Why tiny? Tony T O N Y. Okay, <laughs> it's your Australian Amer- accent. <laughs> yes, Americans get that. <laughs> Americans hear tiny all the time. <laughs> I, I, I have to slow down a little bit. <laughs> Thank God. It's not just me. <laughs> no. Well, like, and it's funny, every time you're in America, every time I'm in America and I go, you know, they ask for a name at a coffee shop or something and I go, uh, Tony, and they they write down Tiny and look at me, I'm six foot four. <laughs> you're not. And a hundred and a hundred and a hundred and five kilos. Um, I'm not Tiny. That makes total so, sense. Yeah, so they look at me sideways and go, Tiny? No, sorry, <laughs> Tony. See, that, <laughs> that's where Anthony comes in handy. <laughs> yes, he probably would. <laughs> so Tony Priddle on uh, Facebook and we transcend, uh, dot yes. net. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Tony. I've had such a great time talking to you today. May you keep shining your light on this world, making it easier for other people. That's definitely my goal is to just shorten the time it takes to understand this so they can actually enjoy the best genetic years of their life, giving everything that they have. What a gift. That's what I, that's what I missed out on. Hmm. Ah, thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. For being here it's today been my, it's been my pleasure and for everyone who's been listening to this podcast i want to thank you for taking a step towards living your best life i hope this talk has inspired you if so please share it with others this has been another episode of rethink fit and grow podcast until next time <laughs>